the right slide. Uh, let's see. This is like an awkward way to start the presentation, right? Okay, there we go, there we go. Uh, okay, so yeah, my name is Glenn Cates. I'm the head of digital at Current Time, which is a 24-hour uh, day Russian language TV channel. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit later. Um, but right now, I want to tell you that on this thumb drive, I have all the secrets to combating this information, but I only have 15 minutes to speak, so I won't have time to talk about it. Um, so, I just want to show you something really quickly. This is something that actually appeared on my newsfeed. It actually appeared on my newsfeed. It was shared by someone who may or may not have been a relative. Okay, so um, would anyone in this room see this online and share? Of course not. I mean, we, we all see this and we, we, it's like ridiculous in so many different ways. Um, that's not how viruses work, first of all. Um, if it appeared on BBC, I think it might be appearing some other places. You know, we would automatically know um, that that wouldn't be the right way to share. So, uh, how many times do you think this was shared? Yeah, so um, at least 10,000 times. Um, I actually went back uh, when I was thinking about this and I tried to figure it out, but I, I think actually the original post eventually was removed. But when I saw it, it was at least 10,000 times. Okay, so, um, so what? Uh, the point is this. Um, we, everyone in this room, recognized immediately that that would be something that we would not want to share, right? We knew immediately that there was something really strange about this post. Um, but, like, is anyone here a doctor? Yeah, so, um, and most people actually, most people actually who we're trying to reach are not journalists. Uh, most people who we're trying to reach are not uh, civil society activists, right? And we can't expect everyone we're trying to reach to have the same sort of tools and, um, and have the same interest in getting to the bottom of every single story they see on Facebook. In fact, oftentimes the things that people share are the things that sort of like reinforce their own beliefs and also strike some sort of emotional chord with them. Um, so when I'm thinking about disinformation problems, and not just me, when people are thinking about disinformation, um, they often think about these four things but unfortunately, they often think about them separately, um, rather than like uh, together. So information, right? We have like really, really good fact-checking sites. Um, you know, we've mentioned Politifact. In Ukraine, there's uh, stopfake.org. Uh, in Romania, I know there's some really good ones. Um, so those are nice, but uh, who is the audience for those, for those things? Uh, there's also, people talk about media literacy. Um, you know, a lot of countries are starting sort of like courses for people to learn sort of how to, you know, how to recognize information that just doesn't seem right. Um, but that's like really a long-term project. Uh, people talk uh, a lot about um, trust. And um, we saw in an earlier presentation what trust in the media is right now. It's not very high. Uh, people tend to trust the people, the actual people, the actual human beings in their circle. Um, and then, a problem that I think a lot of people really, really don't think about when thinking about disinformation is distribution, right? So we have, we have like the facts checking, checking sites, we have media literacy, and we have trust, but like, you know, how do you, who's the audience for this, this kind of content? Um, so, just to give you a little bit of context, I'm gonna start talking about current time and what we've been doing I want to talk really, really briefly about sort of Russia and the uh, former Soviet Union more, more broadly. Um, TV, again, not everywhere, but at least in Russia, TV is state controlled um, and still the dominant platform for getting news and information. Um, there is increasingly less freedom online. Uh, maybe you've heard that Russia is trying desperately to ban Telegram. Um, today they also banned um, like at least 200 sort of VPN um, applications. And uh, people started talking about dis disinformation really, really seriously uh, four years ago when the crisis in uh, Ukraine started because much of that crisis is due to uh, disinformation, particularly disinformation um, in Russia. So, um, 
About three years ago, um, there was this little TV program called Current Time. It was a 30 minutes uh, syndicated program, and I was asked to like start something digital. Okay, so cool, start something digital. And we like, you know, we we had this idea where um, we wanted to reach audiences and give them information that maybe they weren't getting um, on their social networks, on their news feeds. And um, when we were thinking about that, we were not thinking about like creating a fact-checking site. Uh, we were not uh, thinking about creating um, courses in school. We were actually thinking about how we can be a news organization that tells really important stories, that gives people information, um, and gets it out in a way that people will actually um, you know, have it and engage with it. Um, so we knew who, who we wanted to reach. We wanted to reach sort of uh, uh, 18 to 42 demographics, some level of education, basically people who had an open mind about the world around them. Um, we knew what kind of content we wanted to reach them with. We had a really good network of reporters, um, not just in Russia and Ukraine and Central Asia, but also um, in Europe and the United States. Um, so the real question for me was like, how are we going to distribute this content? And uh, we looked at our um, <coughs> our competitors, right? And at this time, um, news organizations, particularly the, the good and serious ones, um, looked at uh, social media for what? Traffic, traffic to the website. Um, we sort of thought about it differently. We thought, okay, I, like, I actually didn't care about traffic to the website. Uh, I, I didn't tell you this, but current time, um, is a nonprofit. We, you know, the advertising model. That's I know that's really important for the media. For us, it was really important. We actually thought we could tell stories on the platforms that people were using. Um, so the first thing we did is phones still did exist at that time. So uh, you know, we took out our phones. We thought about like how people are using um, social media, right? And think about yourself, right? Like when you're scrolling through Facebook, you're not stopping at every single post, right? You're not like, you're just going like this, yeah? So something has to grab your attention. Um, and then once something grabs your attention, uh, you have to, you don't have like headphones on usually, right? So it has to be something very visual. You can't hear something as you're scrolling through Facebook yet. Um, and then once you get there, uh, my job is to keep your attention because if you're bored for like a second, uh, you're, you're leaving me, right? So it's, it's a big challenge. Um, but it's a challenge that, um, that we've had some success with. And uh, what's, what's really cool um, for me is that um, through the years, I don't have VK and I'm the classic key on this chart, but, but these are, they're sort of doing the same things. Um, all of the best features from different social platforms have all sort of come together, right? So um, when we started at current time, um, I was really kind of annoyed because everyone in the West was talking about these cool Snapchat stories, like these news organizations were doing like really innovative things with Snapchat. And I really wanted to do that stuff. I thought it was really cool. Well, luckily for me, um, basically everyone has sort of poached Snapchat's best idea, which is stories, right? So Instagram, VK, Omni uh, I think I'm the classic Instagram, uh, everyone basically has a story format. So we have all kinds of different formats for, um, for getting important, interesting information out uh, to people. So I'm going to go back a little bit to, um, to, what I told, uh, to what I told you, what we were talking about at the beginning, right? So um, one of the things we talked about is uh, media literacy. Uh, and when I'm talking about these things, I want you to picture them not here on this, this big board, but on these uh, formatted for these different platforms. Because that's what we do. We try to find ways to tell stories in interesting ways on the platforms that people are using. So I'm going to show this really briefly because I'm running out of time. So here's a, here's a quick sort of like, this was uh, people were talking about quote unquote, you know, fake news, right? So this picture that appeared, that might have appeared in your news feed, here's like a little like quick explainer about how you might recognize something that is fake. Oh. Ah. Okay, I swear it was really cool. Um, uh, what did I do? 
I actually don't know how to use technology. Um, oh, it's the green one. Okay, so uh, I heard some people laugh when uh, when this man appeared on the screen. So this is yeah, it's Dimitri Kostyukov. Oh. Hey guys, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So, he... I swear I didn't drink it. Um, listen, I only have five minutes anyway, so I'll just tell you really quickly. So, the first thing I was going to show you um, was basically a, a narrative explainer on um, sort of how you can take some basic steps when you see something online um, to sort of tell if it might be real or if not. Um, so that's sort of like the media literacy. Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron are having a dreamment. They've decided to leave the EU and unite France and Germany into a single state. That just smells fishy, doesn't it? Right. It's not true. It's fake news. Don't share it. But what about when you're not so sure? The golden rule is to always go to the source. Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron. Okay. No, I want to go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, so you, you got a taste of that. If you want to watch the whole thing, we can watch it later. Um, we also have a cool show. It's called Smokri Volva in Russian. It, it means see from both sides. Uh, one of the really interesting things it does is it looks at how different media can, uh, covers a big story. And you just you watch it and you decide as a viewer. Um, it also um, attempts to find actual sort of like disinformation that appears in different media and um, debunk it, basically. So, um, Russian state TV is obsessed with uh, Ukraine, um, and this is just one example. I'm going to show you like five seconds from it. Okay, so um, we also show like really cool uh, infographics that can sort of be shared across um, social media. This is about the, uh, the doping scandal. Um, and finally, this is really important. We're not sitting there every day talking about like how we can like um, win the information. Well, we're actually covering really, really important stories. And this is important for gaining uh, trust of our audience. So here's a quick video about a curbside in the Russian town of Yekaterinburg. Мне пошел по где-то 50 тысяч рублей. Было на него вообще не месяцев. Ну это как бы все полностью, начиная от момента проектирования. Зачем? Я устал от газет в городе. So, um, all of these things actually um, did, did quite well for us. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to focus on numbers too much, but we're pretty new. We had 400,000 video, uh, 400 million uh, video views of our content in 2017. Um, we have over a million followers across social media. And uh, why is that actually important besides the numbers? So now, when there are actually really, really big stories, um, we uh, have a platform with a very large audience to actually give people real information. Um, and I have one minute left, so I'll just focus on the came, came out of a, a fire, uh, the mall fire that happened about a month ago. Um, this was actually interesting because um, there was a lot of um, disinformation um, going on about this. It was a very serious event. Um, over 60, more than 60 people died, including many school children. Um, there were rumors all over the internet about what was going on, that like um, the Russian government wasn't reporting the real death toll, that actually like 300 people, um, people died. Uh, we actually were able to provide live coverage from the scene, um, live streaming on Facebook, YouTube, for contacting, um, cutting smaller videos, telling more detailed stories with the reporters that were actually there. And actually, um, in this case, we actually saw how when it came down to real serious situations, um, we 
the people actually didn't trust the government, but we were able to tell them um, what was actually happening because we had people there. And just our just that one week of coverage was viewed online 16 million times. So um, we're having real, real impact, and I'm being told to stop. But um, just just one really, really important thing: when we have our editorial meetings in the morning, um, we're talking about what's important. We're talking about how we can add value to a story. We're talking about what formats we can use to tell our story. I promise you, um, we never sit there and say, like, how, how can we overcome fake news? How can we in the, win the information war? It's a very organic process. It's, it's about um, giving people information and distributing it. Thank you very much, Glenn. Thank you. Um, I have one, two questions. Okay. First is, uh, what's your business model? And the other one is, you use a lot of these third-party pilot platforms, yes. Facebook, Twitter, etc. Yeah. Um, they are like moving in the direction of being paid media. The organic reach is falling there. Why, like, how are you going to tackle so, that? So this is, a, I knew like some of the things I said would be really controversial. In some ways, this is like so two years ago. But, um, but, but actually, we, what we've done, um, Facebook, I hate Facebook. Um, we have a big presence on Facebook, but because we've uh, distributed across platforms, we also have a really large pres presence on VK. Um, we have, uh, we're growing our Instagram um, channel. We have a huge presence on YouTube. Um, we, I'm of course scared about it, but right now, uh, people, our audience, are still using these platforms. They're still using these platforms, and until we're totally cut off from those platforms, we have to, I have to be thinking about it. I have to be thinking about where our audience is. So um, it's scary, but to be honest, I haven't seen, uh, we're still growing. I haven't seen the effect of this yet. As for our business model, this is another thing. This is another place where maybe I have an advantage over a, um, a for-profit um, organization because um, Current Time is a uh, part of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, um, which is a non-profit funded by the US government. Thank you. Up there, one. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I have a question. You know, you had in current time, you had a um, uh, Baltian idea about all this. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I want to ask you a question. Do you have uh, in current time some system of uh, control uh, quality of journalistic content? Uh -huh. Because, um, sorry, it's not accusation, but uh, for example, in Ukraine we are not very satisfied with the quality of this uh, product. And uh, uh, I know that, for example, uh, to this uh, <laughs> to this project, one of the journalists uh, before working in Pierre de is uh, Kremlin controlled. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, mm, sometimes it's feeling that some narratives are going through your channel. And what would be the question, brief question? Yeah, uh, I mean, we have, we have, have a, a system of control of uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. We have, I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't speak directly to the Balti. I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. But um, yes, we do have very strict editorial standards. I will say that sometimes um, we're, not, we're not there to make any one country look great or any, put forward any potential political uh, point of view. So I, I can't speak specifically to this thing, but I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards. Hi, I have a question actually about fake news. Uh, previously, I worked in the governmental communications, yeah. and I saw, and uh, part of my job was fighting the fake news as well. And I saw that uh, sometimes some fake news are going viral, and actually our statement afterwards uh, with the truth was not so covered uh, virally. So my question is how to get how how to reach this audience who actually shared and read the fake news information with the truth. Yeah, no, that, so that's, uh, that's exactly what we're trying to do. First of all, I, I will say that like, we don't, like, we can't catch every single fake uh, in, in media. But what we do do is when there is something really big, like you saw that example of this thing that went up on Russian state TV, it was the main evening program. 
we try to tell the stories in a way that people will be interested in sharing it, right? Like, you're telling that story about it being fake news has to be just as interesting as the fake news itself. Um, so, you know, we've done um, infographics, we've done um, videos, we have, um, we're starting this thing sort of, I have to say, like, um, uh, we're sort of copying a little bit the Guardian, what Guardian's been doing, but we're having like this um, stories news quiz um, every week where we'll discuss some of these ideas as well. But this is a huge problem. This is the distribution problem because fake news, or whatever you want to call it, always spreads much further than sort of the correction that happens afterwards.